thoughts uh, of the passing of several loved ones and just other things that have been uh, focus that have been a matter and a concern to me I would like to talk on something uh, devotional this morning I would like to talk on something that's very uh, that matters to us we all deal with it we all live in the realm of this thing it, it's something that we uh, are concerned with each one it's something that uh, none of us can defeat and yet it's something that we have got to learn to control and that is time time God gives each one of us equal amounts of time in which to operate on a daily basis day by day we, he gives us the same number of minutes each day and what we do with our time really is important I have nothing really new to share with you this morning I don't really intend to try to teach my purpose is to review and to reflect on something that we're already familiar with but it is good to stop at certain points in our lives and just to reflect to think about to look at ourselves to take a little bit of self-analysis and to see whether or not we're using this most precious commodity the way the Lord would have us. That's what I would like to do this morning. I like to look at four characteristics of time. And to just look what the Bible has to say about what we should be doing in light of these things. The first thing is that time is the essence of opportunity. Please turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that's right in the middle of your Old Testament Job Psalms Proverbs Ecclesiastes Job Psalms Proverbs Ecclesiastes we're going to be coming back to Ecclesiastes several times this morning so you might want to keep your put a piece of paper here and this will be a kind of like a major base of our thoughts but we will be looking at several other scriptures as well Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and a few verses in this chapter show us that time is the essence of opportunity there's a little phrase that, that you can buy it on plaques and and sticky paper and uh, and so forth at the bookstore I've seen it several times where which says that today is the first day of the rest of your life today is the first day of the rest of your life it's a good thing to remember sometimes when we've failed the Lord when we get up and we wonder what is the purpose for living we, we we're so filled with frustration at our lack of attaining the goals that we set for ourselves we're disappointed in our performance we just were discouraged it's a good thing to reflect upon well tomorrow is a new day and the day after that is a new day too and every day brings with it new opportunities and that is the point that we want to think about this morning time is the essence of opportunity the first verse of this maybe we should read the the first eight verses of this uh, I guess it's a familiar chapter you've probably heard it at funerals and weddings and other occasions Solomon wrote to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted a time to kill and a time to heal a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to to get 
get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. The thing that we need to remember when we're at a low ebb in our lives, when we're going through the traumatic experiences of life, whether it's the passing of loved ones or similar experiences, it's this fact that time goes on. Time goes on. And yes, yesterday and the day before might have been a time to cry. For someone it was a time to die, it was a time to weep, it was a time to lose, uh, perhaps a time to keep silence, but tomorrow is a new day and it probably holds the opportunity for you to do the opposite of that. Instead of weeping there can be rejoicing. And We've got to realize that, you know, that life does not end with the passing of single momentous events. Today is a new day, and things happen different every day. Uh, Solomon goes on, and a little bit later on in the, this chapter, he says uh, in verse 15, that which has been is now. In other words, what went on yesterday is still going on today. You know, people die every day, and people are born every day. And he goes on to say, and that which has, which is to be, has already been. Right? Same thing that is going to continue. And God requires that which is past. The significant thing about time is that, yes, every day is a new opportunity, and we can change what we have done in the past. What we have failed in the past, God gives us the, a gift every morning to, to be a success today and to be an overcomer today and to win and to, and to learn new things today. We don't have to just follow into a rut and, and to think that, well, all these things, they've determined my existence and I'm going to live this out and there's nothing I can do to really change it you know I'm 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 a miserable failure or there's nothing I can do to change this situation that's wrong there's always something you can do to change a situation independence upon the Lord today is a new day yet the point for us to remember is that everything we do every day today it says God requires that which is past tomorrow today is going to be the yesterday and God requires that which is past only what's done for Christ is going to last in the final essence are we going to let our problems of the past prevent us from gaining victory in the present and on into the future we've got to we've got to learn the secret of okay forgetting those things which are behind Paul said and reaching forward to those things which are before, he pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. You see, we're going to see the Lord. And so, yes, we're going to answer for the things done in the past. We can't change those things done in the past because that's history. But we can change those things that are done in the past in, in, in the perspective of what I am doing today. Do I have to do those same things today? Do I have to let those failures and problems and sorrows ruin me today no I don't have to do that it's very important what do we do since time is the essence of opportunity well Solomon went on over in chapter 11 and for those of us who fit into this category we can take heart we can actually do something about this since we have lots of time or we think we have lots of time as young people Solomon says rejoice verse 9 of chapter 11 rejoice O young man in thy youth and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth 
and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. First verse of chapter 12, Remember now literally thy creators in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw near, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. See, since every day is a new opportunity, young people need to learn the lesson to appreciate, to revel in, to enjoy, to thrill in the time of their youth because youth passes on into old age. And yet, uh, old age is not uh, a helpless and a hopeless uh, age of life. You have all that experience to draw on. You have the knowledge of what you have gained, or you have gained much knowledge and wisdom and satisfaction. And um, it is just as true that an older person can rejoice in today as a younger person can rejoice in today. Each day is a new day. But this is a, an interesting passage. Young people, rejoice in what God has given you. Some of us are younger than others. Let's each one take the opportunity that God has given us today. Today. It's not an insignificant thing that one of the most oft-repeated phrases in, in the New Testament is, Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts against the Lord. The Spirit speaks today, and today is the day. You see, um, For instance, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, I'll just read that. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul is quoting from the Jewish scriptures where he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And you know, remember, it's, it's rather important that Paul is not encouraging these Christians to get saved. He's not reminding them that today is the day of salvation so that they can get saved again. The point of the matter is, is that even Christians need to learn how to gain deliverance from the Lord. And that word salvation is deliverance. Today is the day of deliverance. It's, it, yes, it is true that if you're a, a person here this morning that perhaps has never personally trusted in Jesus Christ, today is the day that you better make your choice because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. No one thought last night that John was going to die at the kitchen table. See, no one thought that. No one expected it. It was a shock. Totally unexpected. Today is the day of salvation. Put your faith in the Lord today if you have not. And yet, Christians, it's just as true to us, for us, individually, that today is the day of salvation, really, literally. Deliverance from whatever the hang-ups are that we carry. The fears, the sorrows, the burdens, the traumatic experiences. Today is the day of salvation. See, every day, God extends grace to us. The grace of God didn't only come through Christ 2,000 years ago. It is true that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, John 1.16. It is true, Titus 2.11, that um, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. That is true. And yet, is not God alive today? Is Christ not living in my heart and in your heart today if, if we're his children? Yes, it's true. And because it's true, then He offers us grace. Moment by moment, grace and deliverance for the trials of life. So time is the essence of opportunity. That's why it says in Hosea 10, 12, we should seek the Lord today. Seek the Lord today. A second characteristic of time is that for man, it is short. We've alluded to this. Time is, first of all, the essence of opportunity. Second, Time for man is short. It has a beginning and it has an end. Again, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know or that I don't know. But let's reflect, reflect upon that little corner of the truth for a moment. Time is short. It has a beginning and it will end. When was the last time that you, were, you caught, it became 
uh, a point to your consciousness that, well, I won't have perhaps all the time that I think I might have. I think older people tend to think more about the shortness of time than younger people do. You know, because they can see it. I think they do. The time is short. And yet, the time may be just as short for a younger person as for an older person. Time for man is short. Notice some of the descriptions of time and life that David gives us in Psalm 89. Psalm 89. read verses 47 to 48 David says remember how short my time is why have you made all men in vain what man is he that lives and shall not see death shall he deliver his soul from the power of Sheol David was well aware of the fact that he was living on borrowed time <laughs> it's quite significant that the 89th Psalm is a poem literally that David the sweet psalmist of Israel wrote on the occasion of God promising him the great promises of the Davidic covenant and that are recorded in 2nd Samuel chapter 7 God said David I'm going to give you an eternal throne an eternal kingdom an eternal posterity you know you're going to have a descendant on the throne of David forever and ever and then David writes this psalm and he looks at the other side of it, the human side, and he looks around him at the people he knows, and he looks at his ancestors, and he looks at his own self. He looks at his son that just died at eight days old, and he says, man, what is man? How short my time is. Is this really possible that God is going to bring me into eternity and give me his sweet blessings for eternity? How short time is. David was aware of it. Paul was aware of it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29, the time is short. James chapter 4, verse 14 says, Behold, um, our life is but a vapor, a wisp of gas. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, the time is at hand. And that's rather significant because 2,000 years ago, Christ revealed the, the revelations in the book of Revelation to John the Apostle. And in the very preface to, his, to this unfolding of future events, Christ points out to John a very significant commentary on these events. He said, the time is at hand. In other words, it's standing right beside you and it's just about ready to fall over into your experience, John. You know, it's here. It could, it could start tomorrow, the tribulation. You see, these things that are discussed all through this revelation, they're, they're at hand. There are no guarantees of tomorrow uh, being like it is today. That's why you go back to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 2, what we were reading a few moments ago. And it says... There is a time to be born and a time to die. In other words, it's not a nebulous thing. We don't believe in the, in, in, uh, in the law of return like the Hindus and the Buddhists do, that, you're going to, uh, that life is just one unending cycle from reincarnation through change to another incarnation. The Bible says there is a beginning and there is an end. When you, you, you are born and you die and it's black and white. And the Bible goes on to say in Hebrews 9.27, It is appointed unto men. God has a set point in his program to die. And after that, it is also appointed unto men to be judged. So what do we do in light of these things? Well, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 says, Walk circumspectly, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Be ye not unwise, but learn what the will of God is. That's a bad qu quotation of it. But the point is, is okay, you're given a certain amount of time, and we, we know for a fact that it's short. Now, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to play tiddlywinks? 
or are we going to buy it up? You know, most people take buying uh, seriously. Some people, are, you know, let it slip through their fingers a little faster than others, but we all, you know, you just don't go out and throw $100 bills in the gutter on Queen Street. We take, you know, you put a little bit of forethought into it. You plan. You price around. You check up on it. At least it pays, you know. You know, all the lumber yards in town are going to have a different price for a sheet of material. Okay, when you buy it, you it it's it's a wise thing to think it out, and that's the same thing that Paul is saying. Listen, the time is short. Redeem, buy your time, buy your time. What does it mean? Purchase it, put effort into it. Okay, you know that you're going to have, or you think, you expect today to have 12 or 18 hours in which to do your things. Are you going to slot any of those moments for? reflection on the Lord? Are you going to leave your schedule lax enough so that you're going to be free to talk to people about the Lord? About eternal things? You know, what about the kids? Are you going to spend time with your kids? You know, because maybe you'll die and you won't have time to spend with your kids. And when was the last time you sat down and talked with your wife or your husband or showed them by giving of your time to them that they matter to you? you know, what are we doing with our time? When was the last time we gave time to the Lord in service? You know, it's not very many people that do what Jim and Michelle did this summer. And that's not the only way to serve the Lord, but, you know, it is important to give the Lord time. There are many people that have, and the Lord blesses them for it. What are we doing with our time? Time is short. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 and following, he says, The time is short, therefore let the husbands be as if they were unmarried. You know, and they that use this world is not abusing it. Because why? The fashion of this world is in the process of passing away. We are in a stage of evolution. Things are changing. You know, this world is going downhill. It is running out. God knows. God knows. And every one of us is a living example of this. The wrinkles are getting bigger and more numerous. You know? And the creaks and the groans and the pains and the, the increasing ability, the infirmities, you know, we're just getting more that way all the time. We're not, we've got to use our time wisely. Doesn't mean we're to divorce our wives. Of course not. But are we going to live solely for a woman? Or solely for a man? Are we going to let that be our whole realm of existence without thinking of the other things, about the Lord's will, about all these people that are going to hell? Time is short. It has a beginning. It has an end. And I hope that in your life, and I need to remind myself of it, that the bell is going to ring someday. And I want to be ready. I want to have put enough effort into the important areas of life rather than coming up short, you know, and having put all my energies into making money, you know, or building houses, or making a friend and intimate out of my wife, or this or that. There are more important things in life that we've got to consider. The third characteristic of time is that it is filled with trouble and need, and it ends with judgment. <laughs> time is filled with trouble and need, and it ends with judgment. Back in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Look at the negatives. A time to die. A time to kill. A time to break down. A time to weep. A time to mourn. A time to refrain from embracing. A time to lose. A time to tear. A time of hate. A time of war. And all the way through this book, which, is the, which are the natural observations of Solomon when he was out of the will of God, and not everything that Solomon says in this book are true, because they were his natural reasonings, but they were normal. They were ordinary observations of life. They're the same observations that you and I can make today. We could all write a book like this. Look around you and what do you see? You don't see the world becoming a better place, do you? No. If a realistic <laughs> evaluation of life includes the hospitals and the asylums, you know, you know, the, the taverns, <laughs> you know, 
the bums, the hitchhikers, you know, all these people that have wasted their minds and their bodies, you know, the crippling diseases, the disasters, you know, life is more filled with sorrow than it is with joy. In this country, we see a lot more joy than we see of sorrow. But what if you lived in India or Pakistan or Afghanistan or Southeast Asia? Life is filled, time is filled with trouble and need, and it ends in judgment. Even in this, this passage in 15, Solomon says, God requires that which is past. Down in verse 17, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Someday, whether we want to really think about it or not, God is going to reserve some time in his plan and program to review our lives, to recall what we have done, and to pass sentence on it. The great thing about being a Christian is that God is not going to bring up a single sin because he removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west and he remembers them no more. And if that's true, then he's not going to bring them back up a remembrance in the judgment day. But when we stand before Christ, the things that we give answer for in our bodies are going to be the worthless versus the good. The worthless versus the good. There's going to be a judgment. Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that it's just as much appointed to have a judgment. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says that in the last days perilous times shall come. And we are definitely living in the last days. Perilous times. So what do we do about it since we're living in perilous times? What do we do about it since the traumas of life do hit us momentarily, without warning, at different points in our lives? What do we do about it in bereavement? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ the righteous, and we can, ha we can approach boldly the throne of grace to find help and grace in the time of need in the time of need it actually says that in the time of need when we do face our troubles and we have needs and fears go to the Lord that's what David did we see this in Psalm 69 verse 13 Psalm 69 verse 13 he stresses the fact that every moment is acceptable with the Lord he says, but as for me, David writes, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me, and the truth of thy salvation, deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Have you ever felt like you're sinking? I have. You know, there's just, sometimes it feels like it's just getting piled on so thick that you just don't know which way to go, and there's no human way to get out of it. You're going to go through it, you know, the minutes are going to roll by, you know, you can't stop the sorrow and the pain and the suffering. It's, you're going to go through it, I'm going to go through it. But in it all, the thing to remember is that it's always an acceptable time to go to the Lord and say, my prayer is unto thee, my prayer is unto thee. That's why it's, it's really important that we, we as Christians take this phrase, today is the day of salvation, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, and don't just refer that to other people who need to get saved, but it's, it applies to us. Today is the day that the Lord will deliver us out of our troubles and our needs, and that's how you handle them. God has promised judgment, and he's promised that there's going to be troubles, and God brings trouble into the world. That may seem shocking, <laughs> but it's true. God told Pharaoh, I'm going to make it hail, and I'm going to make it destroy your crops and your children and your possessions. I'm going to bring it. And Pharaoh said, I don't care. I'm not going to listen to that. And so God did it, and he kept his promise. God promised Egypt. He says, the day of their calamity was come upon them 
the time and the time of their judgment. See, God has promised calamity and judgment. It says in the book of Isaiah, I create evil. That's God speaking. He says, I create evil. Do you believe that? You better believe it because God is in sovereign control. And he feels and he works out his own purposes by allowing evil in this world. It's not his fault that you sinned or that I've sinned. But he creates many calamities and distresses and sorrows because he, that draws people to a point of acknowledgement of their own helplessness, their own inabilities, and it's supposed to draw them to him who is the source for the help to go through those very calamities and to learn of him and learn to fear him. And that's why Solomon says back in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, let's go back there because this is um, a good picture of it. He says in verse 14, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it. Why? That men should fear before him. We've been talking about fear the last few weeks. And you know, when God does a work, you can't reverse it. You can't change it. When someone, when God takes your loved one, you can't reverse it, can you? learn to fear don't become bitter don't blame God don't say Lord I hate you for bringing this problem into my life learn to fear <laughs> learn to fear submit to the Lord he has a reason Romans chapter 8 verses 28 29 those most familiar verses to us as Christians we know we are persuaded we can be assured that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, nothing's an accident. It's all his purpose, a sovereign plan. I'd like to conclude this morning by looking at one final characteristic of time, and that is that time is ordered by the sovereignty of God, which we've just alluded to. Yes, time is filled with trouble and need. Yes, time is short. It has an end. Time is an opportunity, and it's all of those other things because of this last thing that we're looking at, and that is that time is ordered by the sovereignty of God. In other words, he sets everything in motion. In other words, he knows what is going to happen. There's a doctrine in the scripture called predestination and foreordination. Predestination, you can almost get the idea in the word, pre destiny in other words beforehand he lays out my destiny and that's not just a an abstruse term that theologians use it's right out of the Bible in, in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 9 through 11 it says that God having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance that's Christians having been predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. You see that? God has laid out your destiny. Before you ever heard of Jesus Christ, God knew that you were someday going to get saved. And he brought you to himself. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except the Father draws him. You see, the times are in the Father's hand. Acts chapter 1, verse 7, the disciples said, Are you going to bring the kingdom, Lord? And Jesus responded to them and says, It's not given to you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father has put in his own hand. I, that's why you don't trust people that predict the future. Because the Father has the times in his hand. And unless you're the predictions that men make are based upon the predictions that God makes, you better not trust them because they aren't certain. Satan and his demons are capable of counterfeiting 
and benefiting from their ageless wisdom that they have accumulated by watching God's plan and program for the last 10,000 years of human history. They have watched it and they can make good educated guesses and they can reveal to people tendencies and so forth and a lot of prophecies do come true but don't trust them if they don't come from God's word. God is the one that's in sovereign control. All you've got to do is read through the book of Daniel. You know, it's God that said to Daniel that there is a time appointed, 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city. Determined in the plan and program of God. See? Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says that in the fullness of time God sent forth his son. See, God sent Christ into history at a precise moment in history. What this should show us is, and it should give us confidence as God's people in the fact that the world in which we now live is not something that's out of control in the hands of the devil who is the God of this age. No. This Father in heaven, our loving Father, who holds us by his hand, who makes wonderful promises and provisions for us, is in control. The times are in his hand. And we must believe it and rest upon it. And at the same time, it should sober us. Unfortunately, there are many people, and many Christians fall into this category too, that uh, would fit in the shoes of the Pharisees to whom Jesus said a very significant statement one time. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 3, Jesus said that you people can discern the face of the sky, but you can you not discern the signs of the times? In other words, God has given us clues. We can tell what's going to happen, basically. We should be depending on God's promises rather than on our hunches <laughs> and on our human desires. We've got we've to just say, Lord, okay, I know this is happening. I know that the timing of this event, whether it be the passing of a loved one or a blessing from God, I know that this is something that is according to your schedule of events. And I accept it as from you. And in the meantime, help me because it hurts. Or help me not to get proud because I am lifted up today and things are going good. When things are going good, we can be certain that someday in our life, things are going to get worse. That's what Solomon said. And when things are going bad, we can just as equally be certain that things someday are going to get better. So take one day at a time. And let us use the time that the Lord gives us wisely 